Hiring the right team for your financial advisory business is uh, something that sounds very easy, uh, but finding that person is really where the challenge comes in. And uh, it's a discussion that we've had a lot over the last uh, few months, actually, in propulsion. But uh, this week, again, it's something that crept up in our best practice huddle. And uh, I thought, let's, let's get into this topic a little bit more and see what we can do. And uh, also in the community around propulsion, you know, how can we help each other and how can we go about finding the right people for our business and uh, that will really work well with our clients. So looking forward to this morning's session. Uh, so let's get started and uh, see what we've got for you today. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I had to throw like a good morning this morning. Uh, it's been an incredible week. It's been a busy week. Uh, lots have happened this week and even last week. So yeah, really excited uh, to be back this morning with another show. And as I said, we are talking today about finding the right, right staff for your business and uh, for your team. So something that I think is really top of mind for a lot of people at the moment. But also, you know, it's a bit of a more of a challenge, I think, in smaller businesses than sometimes in bigger businesses. We're going to go through a lot of things this morning uh, of how to maybe go about finding uh, the right person and uh, whether you hire somebody who has got all the skills and the experience in the world or whether you start fresh or anything in between. So we're going to be talking about all of that. But this morning is going to be an incredible morning. We've got uh, Lalani freshly back from, I think, Bloemfontein. And anybody that hails from Bloemfontein, even if it was temporarily, is awesome. So uh, we're looking forward to the latest news with Lalani this morning. And then we have Ichno. So Ichno is coming from far, almost from over the seas. That's where he's from this morning. But he's in Kradok, I believe. I, I hope I'm allowed to say that, Ichno. Uh, so Ichno is here. And he's going to talk about Invictus this morning. So really excited for that long story with a very short uh, title. So we'll see what happens this morning. And then Norma is here. Norma is going to talk about the beauty of habits. So looking forward to that. Uh, she's going to be talking about why habits and their significance and uh, helpful tips and mindset stuff that we need to consider. So looking forward to that. I've got two amazing, incredible, very important announcements then this morning as well. And then we'll get into this morning's show. But of course, uh, you can also win a book this morning. And uh, the book that you can win, uh, you've got a, in the comments, you've got to comment hashtag passion. And uh, the reason is that we're giving away passion for the profession, uh, which was uh, Kubis' second book, I believe. Uh, it's about mastering the nine Ps of professionalism. So uh, if you want to stand a chance to win a real book that you can touch and page through and all that stuff, hashtag passion. And uh, we will then give that book away right at the end of today's show. Warm welcome to everybody this morning. Let me say good morning quickly. Terence was in the house first. Terence is fresh and happening and going. So it was awesome chatting to you in the week. Quivers working from anywhere this morning. Uh, Kloppenheim, I don't even know where the heck that is. I know it's on the other side of Dahlstrom somewhere, but uh, never been there. So awesome. Neil Phillips, good morning. Representing the Western Cape. Johan Blumieres, good morning. Nice to meet you. Mr. Mark Lane, hey, you and I need to get together, remember? I forgot about, uh, like, you and I were speaking, and then I was busy, or you were busy, I was busy, and now we haven't touched. I'm going to be linkedin you very soon. Renee, good morning. Nice to see you. Mr. Mark Weston Fort, representing the KZNs of South Africa. We've got Adrian Jordan. Good morning. Nice to see you. Joseph von Tonder, good morning. Um, and then we start with the hashtags. And Kuba uh, says that was his first book. Fantastic. I thought the RDR one was sort of uh, the first book, but fantastic. We'll get to that one as well. Craig Finch, good morning. Nice to see you. Sirieta, uh, thanks for commenting. And Gugu, good morning. And Mr. Craig Finch with a hashtag passion. Ladies and gents, let's get the show on the road. Happy uh, to be here with you this morning. And with coffee. I haven't had coffee on the show for a very, very long time. So I uh, hope you have your coffee or whatever else you need to get through today. But uh, enjoy. Let's head on over to Lalani and hear what she has for us uh, this morning. Lalani, over to you. Good 
Good morning, Francia, and thank you for this opportunity this morning and morning, everybody. As I'm sitting here in the FBI's office, I can see candidates walking past my office because the professional competency examination is being written as we speak. It was yesterday and today, and then a special shout out from me, the CEO of the FBI, to the candidates, rock this exam. So good luck for everybody. Then happy Heritage Day um, for Sunday, and yes, enjoy your public holiday on Monday as well. Francia and team, by now it's old news, but it's still worthy news. If you look at the Monetary Policy Committee, they've decided to keep South Africa's key interest rates steady at 8.25% for a second consecutive meeting. This means that the commercial prime rate lending rate <clears throat> remains at 11.75%. Now, from the news, I can pick up that there was a little bit of debate on the MPC committee because not everybody agreed two members actually wanted to still increase the interest rate. Let's ask why. If you look at the inflation, it has slightly picked up to 4.8%. But as we know, that's still within you know, the range that the MPC is looking at, which is between 3 to 6%. Now, we need to keep that inflation in check um, so that we don't have more interest rate hikes. But uh, yes, they are having a debate whether they should increase it to the next round or not. Now, what also happened this week, if you don't know who they are, let me quickly tell you who they are. National Assembly's Standing Committee on Finance, I call them in short the ESCOFs, um, they had their public hearings this week on the two-part system. Now, from what I can gather, there was a lot of debate with Kusatu in the mix. So the two things that we see, Francia and team, which is not a surprise, is Kusatu is not happy with that seed capital of 25%. That's either 10% of the vesting part or 25,000 rand. They want to push it up all the way to 50,000 rand. So let's see where we end up with that. Um, and if we look at the responses that IRFA, which is the Institute for Retirement Funds in Africa, as well as the CISA and FBI's responses, our written response was, was basically the same to National Treasury to say, you know, that the, the 1st of March 2024 is way too soon. So CISA and IRFA was quite verbal to say, you know what, give us another 18 months, which means that the go-life date may actually only be 2026. But let's see if National uh, Assembly and National Treasury and everybody that is important accepts that date. And the reasons was that we will simply not be ready. Think what needs to happen at SARS, things what needs to happen with, you know, the fund rules. But FBI's response to National Treasury and SARS was plus minus the same. Then if you've missed it, as a financial services provider, the Financial Sector Conduct Authority has published its budget for next year, but also the fee proposals. Um, so that budget is open for public comment. It is on the website. If you want to go look, what is the FECA spending their money on? And if you want to comment on the fee um, rates. Now, only a five minutes. There's a lot of fees that's increasing. But the bottom line, Francia and team, it looks like the overall increase is about 6% for all fees that the FECA charge, which is slightly above what inflation is at the moment. Now, from the FBI, I did tell you that we've got candidates writing the exam as we speak. Again, good luck to everybody writing the exam. And then please don't miss the upcoming tax planning workshop on the 28th of September, which is from about 10 to 9 in the morning to about quarter past 12 in the afternoon. Topics will focus on Section 42 transfers, immigration tax, um, as well as more information around the tax ombud and their, um, and, and their mandate. So we'll have Talita Mort, Martin, the side note, Darren Britz, and Michaela Pashini, who would be our speakers. With that, Francois, I wish you a very happy Heritage Day and may the Bokka win this weekend. And blessings to everybody and call. Goodbye. <music>Fantastic. Yeah, I was wondering like why two still wants to increase it, right? Uh, like when you have a lot of disposable income, right? Uh, but yeah, glad that things stayed the same uh, in that uh, regard. And good luck to all the people writing their PCE exams, their board exams uh, today. So we wish you all the best. And uh, next up we have Ichnu. So Ichnu, change your angle. You know, uh, angle, uh, angle. <laughs> Ichnu always has a fantastic story to help us do exactly that. And this morning he's talking about Invictus. Really excited for today's session. All the way live from Kradok. Here is Ichnu van Ikerk. <music>
Hi, everybody, and welcome from the little guest house in Craddock where I'm staying. Um, it's rugby World Cup time at the moment. And uh, what do you tell a team when they go out, especially if you are one of those innovative coaches that uses lights and changes the, the whole game, the whole game plan? Uh, because I think that's what we often have to do is to change the game, change the game plan and be innovative. And I remember in the 1995 Rugby World Cup, uh, we had uh, Francois Pinar, Nelson Mandela, that whole setup. And Mandela gave the Springbok rugby team a poem, Invictus. I'm not sure whether any of you knows what the meaning of Invictus is. You can probably put it in the text chat if you know. But I want to share that poem with you today because it's the 23rd of September. Those of you who live in the the three-month year will know that you can actually start doing all your sales and planning for 2024 now because it's a three-month lead on to 2024. But, but what's the attitude? Because people are tired this time of the year. And then let, let's just listen to Invictus where he says, Out of the night that covers me, black as a pit, from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. Now, now just, just think about those lines of the poem, the night that covers me. It's, it's dark and difficult times. It's, uh, it's as if he predicted load shedding, didn't he? You know, sort of, and, 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 and then that whole thing about if you want to become happy, be grateful. You know, out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. And then the second verse, where, where we so often find it challenging in our lives, in the fell clutch of circumstance, <laughs> circumstances grabbing you, I have nor winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. The game is tough. The game of sales is tough. The game that you play every day is tough. But it's wonderful if you can say, under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. And then all of us have those days. All of us have those difficult times where you look at the economy, where you look at the load shedding, where you look at the politicians and you look at what's happening. Then you say, well, it's terrible. Well, beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, you know, and yet in the menace of the years finds me and shall find me unafraid. Just imagine this was your motto, your, your logo for the day. And then I, I want to come back to this one because these are the thoughts I want to leave with you for the, for the day where he says it matters not how straight the gate in other words how narrow how tough how how narrow that road is how charged with punishment the scroll you know all kinds of things can go against you he says those final two lines I am the master of my fate I am the captain of my soul so I'm going to give you that poem that uh, I want you to share if any of you have got great quotes which you enjoy which takes you through a tough day but when I'm having tough times you know I, I always remember Invictus and I'm going to give it to you one more last time out of the night that covers me black as a pit from pole to pole I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul in the foul clutch of circumstance I have no wins nor cried aloud under the bludgeonings of chance my head is bloody but unbowed and then beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Whenever you face challenges in your business, remember those two lines. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my, my, uh, of my soul. You're in charge of your thoughts. You're in charge of your actions. You're in charge of your business. Take charge. Make the last three months of the year the best three months of your life. Remember what I told you once. My friend Christos Peace, who lost his leg in an accident, said, never confuse a moment in life with life. Well, uh, if we can take the moment of this year, which is the last three months, let's turn that into the best three months that we can. Thank you, Francois. Thank you, team. Have a lovely, lovely day. And remember to share your favorite quotes and poems. Take care. Have a lovely day. Jeez, that's a tough act to follow. Well done. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have Norma. Norma is talking about uh, the beauty of habits. Uh, so looking forward to this. Norma, let's hear uh, what you have for us this morning.
Good morning. So glad to be back today. So uh, I want to continue what uh, Ichno just uh, spoke about, and let's make this last three months the best three months of this year. And we can do that by building these habits. So my topic for today is, is building habits. And I think it's, it's a good thing for us to achieve goals, but it's also so important for personal growth. So if you look in your own life, have a look at areas where you have these positive, healthy habits and what the results look like in that area of life. And then look at areas where you have maybe destructive habits or maybe unhealthy habits and see what that results and that what that area of life looks like. Now, let's look a little bit at what is a habit and why we want to have habits. And then also, what is the impact or the significance of habits? So it's, it's quite a self-explanatory, a habit. So the dictionary just, just describes it as our practices, our routines, norms, or maybe our little traditions. But the word that struck me was patterns. And I think if we look at our life and the quality of our life, it's really determined by our patterns and our emotions. And that's why we have to be so mindful when we create these habits, because it's so hard to let go or to break these habits. So now the next point is why is it so important to have habits? Now, firstly, we create new neural pathways. So it's comparing it to walking in a grass field. So the first time I walk there, I have to literally make my own way. But then a couple of days later, or some time has gone, and it becomes this little dirt road. And then eventually it becomes this super highway. And it becomes a place where I can move easily, effortlessly, and where it doesn't really take a lot out of me to, to do that. It's, it's very comfortable. Now, that's where I want to be. Um, a habit really makes me see um, the things that I want to do on a consistent basis, that takes the guesswork out of it, that I don't need to think or negotiate it with myself. It's like brushing my teeth in the morning. I don't stand in front of the mirror saying to myself, oh, should I or shouldn't I? I just go ahead and do it because it's so automatic. Now, lastly, why is it so important? What is the impact of these goal, of, the, of these habits? Now, firstly, what comes to mind is that it brings consistency. It's an order that we have in our lives. It's that stability, it's that sequence. So this happens, then that, and then the next thing. It also brings efficiency. So it makes me more efficient in the things that I do because I do them so often that it becomes automatic and I can actually stop thinking about it. I could take that mental space and I can uh, use it in some other area of life. It also helps me grow because as you've noticed, while we're building these habits, it really takes a lot out of us. It takes self-control, it takes uh, persistence, determination, it takes commitment, and that helps us grow, and that also helps us see what's in the way, what's all those obstacles that we place in our own way. It also helps us to achieve our goals. So we see in the future where, what we want, where we want to go, and then we start taking those daily actions, and those daily actions becomes the goal for me. So instead of consistently focusing on that long-term goal, I want to focus on the goal today. And then those little activities and goals that I set daily becomes the next habit. It also helps me with mental and emotional to, um, to improve my health. Because I've become so deliberate and I've become so self-aware, I need to get to know myself better about what I think, what is my choices that I'm making. And that helps me in my life in general with overall health. It helps me to manage my time better because it becomes so automatic and so easy that I take less time to do it. It also reduces stress because the things that I do in my life is very deliberate. I intentionally put them there because um, they're good for me and it serves me. And then lastly, it becomes this positive feedback loop because I do, I create the habits and then I see the results. Then I create another habit and I see the results. So it really becomes the self-reinforcing cycle of improvement for me. Now, I want to invite you to go ahead and have a look at your life and see, seeing that we're approaching the, the, the end of the year, Look at a specific area in your life where you want to introduce some habits and think about the impact that it will have in your life and just the broader areas and maybe the people around you, how that would impact. If you start that habit today, how it would impact your life and to not break that chain. So that's so important. So I have this calendar that is in front of my wall. And daily, when I finish that activity that I want to make a habit over time, I go and I cross it out. And that chain becomes my motivation. 
because when I cross that day out, it means that I have that instant gratification that we all want. And then also it benefits me in the long run because I get the long-term reward. So thank you for being here and uh, I'll be back next week. Awesome stuff. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Norma. So next up, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, there are some two major ones. I've got three, but two are major announcements. So let's do it. Fantastic, right? So uh, the first one would be uh, just uh, if you want to win that book a little bit later, uh, this uh, beauty from uh, Kubis, so the uh, passion for the profession. So just use the hashtag passion in uh, any comment or as a standalone, whatever you want to do, uh, but include the hashtag passion and you will automatically go into the draw uh, to win this book and we'll ship it off to you, uh, deliver it to your door of choice. And uh, you can enjoy uh, that. And also, I know Kerbis is also inviting you. You can book a coffee or a virtual coffee with him as well. So that's absolutely fantastic. So again, thank you, Kerbis, for sponsoring the books. I uh, really appreciate that. All righty. So very first announcements so our first session. This is very important, right? So the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, the CIPC, for those of you who love working in, in acronyms, recently announced uh, the adoption of beneficial ownership amendments uh, to the Companies Act. And uh, part of these sort of amendments are giving the CIPC authority to require companies to file and update beneficial ownership information. Now, what in the world is beneficial information? So uh, we are going to be looking at that uh, on uh, next week, Thursday, the 28th. I'll be joined by Pietro Willefier. She's the Managing Director of Niche Accounting. Uh, we're going to have an in-depth discussion about everything you need to know and to gain a thorough understanding because this is almost like the same as two pots, right? We think about... Uh, but there's massive impacts on us and our businesses, and there's massive impacts on the businesses of our clients. So this is a very important aspect for you to know about and uh, to obviously incorporate in your discussions with your clients and uh, ask if they even know. It's a massive opportunity to add value uh, that maybe many other financial advisors are not even thinking about. So this is an exclusive session for Propulsion members. So if you're not a member, the link is down below as always. So you can go check out what uh, all the things you get for your 350 Rand a month. But uh, this, session, uh, this session is taking place this coming Thursday, the 28th, from 9 until 9.30. And uh, we'll get into uh, what you need to know, which is extremely uh, important. Then the next one is client meeting skills. We are starting with module four this week and uh, questions that change your client's state of mind. That's going to be the topic for module four. Uh, so it's myself and Adam Owen. We are presenting this live also to Propulsion members. So uh, again, uh, something that you can attend. It's every Wednesday. It's a 10-module program, and uh, it's been absolutely fantastic so far. So uh, if you want to get uh, learn more about questions that will help you change the state of mind of your client, then uh, this module coming up this week. And also, all three previous modules, the recordings are available to our members on the platform. So again, if you're not a member, go check it out. And then massive, massive. We have been waiting <laughs> for a long time, right? I've been talking about uh, getting the most out of Microsoft 365 for uh, quite some time now. And uh, what we are going to be doing so uh, is uh, I just want to share with you very briefly the what is going to be in this because we are kicking this off on uh, Thursday, the 12th of October is when this program kicks off again. Uh, only four members. So if you're not a member, if this is not a reason, uh, plus all the other things, then I don't know what's going to get you there. But uh, what are we going to be talking about? So the first module is all about content. So we've got, got Matt Munslow, who is an expert in Microsoft 365 and in collaboration. So uh, he's going to help us get organized with Microsoft 365 and see how we can safely share contents with uh, our clients. So that's going to be the first module. The second module is all on uh, productivity. And in this module, we look at productivity boosting benefits of Microsoft Loop and OneNote and Viva Insights, things that are all part of your, well, for most of you, your Microsoft, you're already paying for this is basically the message. Uh, so we, we need to get to use this. Then uh, the third module will focus on meetings. We will look at how to host a slick meeting, uh, share ideas with Microsoft Whiteboard, and also host top quality client webinars and things through Teams if that is something that you would like to do. 
The fourth module will be on tasks, uh, where we look beyond Outlook, because a lot of us are still using Outlook for this. Uh, so we're looking at To Do and Microsoft Planner, and also managing tasks for the whole office in Teams and in Loop, uh, which is just phenomenal. I've been using this now for for quite some time in the last few months, and it's amazing. I had a long discussion uh, with someone yesterday as well about this, about the, how they can do it in their business. Uh, but these are things we're already paying for, but yet we go look for things outside of the Microsoft uh, environment. Module five is going to be on data. I've been going on about data for since forever, it feels like. But we'll look at some of the data tools in module five, like Microsoft Lists and some uh, BI uh, essentials. So Power BI essentials There's also also Power Query. Uh, which is part of Excel. Uh, I mean, Power Query can do a lot of the things that Power BI can do right in Excel. So we're going to be looking at how we can organize and track key information, which is absolutely vital. I've been going on about that for a long time as well. And then the last one is going to be on security, where we'll be looking at how you can protect your client's data and safely send information using the most up-to-date methods, uh, as well as troubleshooting where things don't quite, quite work out as planned. And I mean, that is absolutely uh, something that does happen sometimes uh, with any software that we use. So really an incredible program, uh, all available to our members at no charge. Uh, it's all included in their, uh, in their membership fee. So uh, if you're not a member yet, go check out propulsion.co.za forward slash community. You can learn anything there. You can hear what other members are saying and uh, do consider becoming part of this amazing group of people who is there for each other and who help and support each other and find a place where you can really belong and where you can grow and where you can thrive uh, at the end of the day. Anyway, so that's all my announcements. I think that was pretty, pretty awesome. And then uh, lastly, uh, you know, like more than half of people who watch this uh, show regularly has absolutely not uh, subscribed yet to this channel, which is, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but it does help us quite considerably if you hit that subscribe button. So please do that uh, if you find value so far uh, and in what we do after this and also maybe some of the other episodes, then please like those videos and share them with others. Help us get the word out. It really means a lot. It doesn't take much energy or effort or any talent for that matter. So uh, if you can help us that way, I will be really, really grateful. It helps us grow the show, get bigger and better guests. And, uh, you know, just like we've already had the most amazing local and international guests, but we can get more. Uh, but the subscriber number has a has a big influence on that. So if you can help us with that, that'll be absolutely fantastic. All right, let's talk about recruitment and finding the right people. So discussions has been happening quite a bit in my world. And obviously, when I talk with different people, and very funny enough, I had a WhatsApp from somebody who's not in financial services who saw this episode. And I was also saying like, oh, we battle with the same things in uh, with our franchisees, etc. So obviously, this is more of a general problem, which on the one hand should make you feel better about this if you are struggling with finding the right people. But Conversations that's happened over and over and over again over the last four or five months uh, in the best practice huddles we do on propulsion and uh, off the platform and sort of just in general conversations with advisors is often I get this like, you know what, I found the perfect person. And then three weeks later, I check in and I go like, so how, did it, how does it go? How's it going? And then they go like, mm, I don't know, it's not working out. It's a very, very different um, approach uh, with uh, sort of what's happening. And uh, at the end of the day, I guess it's got a lot to do with the process that we go through when recruiting, but also there is absolutely unequivocally a shortage of great, specifically admin staff, it seems. So there are excellent uh, admin people out there who support financial advisors and planners, but once that person leaves or moves on to another uh, business maybe or whatever they do, then we're stuck and we can't find somebody to really replace them, which is quite uh, important. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, what we want to do is bring people into our business where it makes sense to do so. We want to bring people into the business that's going to make a real difference and that will plug, either take things away from us or bring certain skills that we lack. So there's loads of things. And then also remember that we've always been talking about outsourcing. So it's always this question around, so do I employ somebody or am I outsourcing this specific function? And I guess the question that you need to answer is for all the things that you need help with, are they core to what it is that you do? 
or are they incidental to what it is that we do? In other words, so if it's core to what we do, it's part of the service we give, the offer, everything that we do. But then, um, on the other hand, when we have the uh, when we when we have to deal with the incidental stuff, it's just things that we have to do, right? Things like uh, we've got to manage our commission, we've got to uh, make sure the IT is working, we've got to make sure that uh, we're doing marketing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those things are not core to the service offering. So probably when you're starting out or maybe you have a very small team is that you first want to hire for those core competencies and those core services that you are delivering and outsource the rest. And uh, it's something that we've actually been doing in our business for the last couple of months. And there's a lot of the things that we do that is not core to the thing. And we've outsourced that very successfully so far. And it's worth doing that because the time I got back is just absolutely um, incredible. But this is really at the end of the day, if you decide to hire somebody for the first time or you have people that leave and you need to replace them, that would be the reason why we would um, want to do that. But there's quite a few challenges that we have at the moment um, as far as this is concerned. And one of the things that came out and it's actually something that uh, Michelle Talliard, there's quite a few things that Michelle Talliard highlighted in our meeting on Wednesday is that one of the things is that, you know, Maybe on a, on the first level, when you've been running a business for a long time and uh, you are looking to find someone or replace someone, you don't find somebody with already that level of skills. And uh, when you do, they are almost unaffordable, right, for where you are maybe at that point. So you can find the most perfect, most fantastic person, but they're outside of your budget. So either they lack the skills that we're looking for or we we battle to pay them what they want. And good people are going to come at a premium because they know they're in demand. They know it's a scarcity. It's not a commodity. Like they are gold in this place. So obviously they, they would want to be remunerated accordingly. And somewhere we need to make a decision whether we will sort of do that or whether we then just carry on on our own and then get stuck in that spiral of not being able to, to, to grow because our time is just eaten up by, by all the other things. But also, I think there's also an issue with, you know, sometimes we want to hire somebody and we're happy to train them up. Because the problem you sometimes have with somebody with all these experience and skills and things is that they are not uh, adapting. They don't want to adapt. They have, it's almost, and I say this with respect and loosely, that uh, it's my way or the highway. This is how I do it. I've been doing it for so long. So they're not always open to, or it's very difficult for them to change their ways and fit in with the way that you work or that you want to work even though they're absolutely incredible at what they do. So often people opt in for, say, let me find somebody brand new, but then what do you look for? Because this is one of the things that Michelle actually highlighted, is that they don't have the basic skills you would uh, um, assume that they would have or expect that they would have. And we're talking about things like being able to use Word and Excel, being able to use a telephone and have a conversation with someone. You know, the bare basic skills sort of that we think, and we think that the youngsters that's coming through school and just finished university, they know technology. They were born with an apple in the hand. And um, sometimes I think it was a real apple and not like this one. So it's one of those things that, uh, you know, we really need to make sure when we are hiring. And I think one of the challenges that people sit with is that we're in a hurry. We need somebody today. We needed somebody yesterday. And we sort of put a job out, and I'll talk a little bit about how we can make this better, but we, we put the job advertisement out, and then we, like the first three CVs we get, we choose the best one uh, out of the three, and then we want to continue. And we even phone the references, and those references is awesome person, brilliant, because they are good friends, or they're just happy to get rid of them themselves. So I don't rely that much on references. You need to go look for things beyond the references on, on the CV. But you may have heard this quote before, is that you should hire slow, fire fast. Now, in South Africa, it's a little bit difficult to fire fast because there's a process and things that you need to adhere to. But once you see this is not working, you need to kick off that process so that you can fire as fast as possible. And in that time, start looking for someone else as well. But these are the things that we're really um, battling with. So, um, you know, Maybe they don't have the advanced skills that we're looking for specifically. If they do, they, they're often unaffordable for, for many advisors. Also, if we want to train somebody up from scratch, they lack the basic skills that we would expect them to have. And then also, there is just a short supply of great admin people. I mean, the amount of messages I get, do you know of someone, mine left 
and went to another practice or to another branch, even within people are poaching because <laughs> there are always people with more money and they say, well, that person is absolutely awesome. They've heard great stuff about them. Let me, I'll pay you 10,000 and more uh, because it means I can do you know, 30 or 40 or 50,000 and more because you take that time away from me. So there's always somebody with more money than you and I, and that's the challenge, right? And also just remember that when we are hiring people, it is about more than just the money. Money is very, very important, but there's other things that are more important as well and that motivate them more. Money is a hygiene factor. At some point, it doesn't matter if you double their salary, if they're unhappy, they're going to be unhappy and they won't do the work the way that they should be doing. But those are just some of the things I think, and you're welcome to share with me in the comments, like what challenges are you facing in this space? Or maybe what has been your past experience? Like where have you gone wrong? Don't be shy, share. This is a learning environment where we can all learn together and learn from each other's mistakes. But also maybe if you had great success, like what was your approach to this? So please share that with us in the comment and add passion, uh, hashtag passion, so you can win that book at the end. But that's the thing, right? So the second thing I want to talk about is the importance of admin staff and why we need them specifically. I would always say before I employ any other kind of position, because I also talk a little bit about hiring for other positions, but admin is such a crucial activity and there's a lot of paperwork. And I'm not just talking about compliance. Yesterday, I was again uh, delivering a, a session uh, to a group of advisors on integrating compliance into the advice process. And it is a big part of what we do, but there's loads of other admin and things that needs to be checked and followed up and scheduled and all of those kind of things. And those things are not income producing activities. So we want somebody else to do that who's very effective and efficient. I said to someone yesterday in a meeting that, please, I am not good at this. You need to run with this. Tell me how to do it better. Tell me how we can, how we can change this. Because I'm open to that because I know I'm not the world's best admin person. But we really got to look for those people who have got an excellent uh, passion for admin and they have a talent for that. And it's not always, as I said before, uh, the, the experience. But the one thing we also need to remember is that a super duper admin assistant from back in 1998 and the one that with all the skills that are required today in 2023 and beyond are two vastly different people. Two vastly different people. And it's got nothing to do with age. It's got to do with skills and being able to communicate in new ways with people and connect with people in new ways, to process things in new ways. And the question is, have you and your office evolved with that as well? You know, are you adopting technology to a large degree? And are you making it easy for clients and for your suppliers and everybody who works with you? Are you making it easy for yourself? And have your admin people evolved with that? Or are you still doing things the same way? Do you still have all the cabinets in the back uh, with those dirty yellow files, et cetera? So these are the kind of things that we also need to just think about because if you are looking for somebody and that's the way you work and you've got people who are used to the new way of working, you're also going to battle to find the right person. So you need to start with yourself and say, but how do we work? Where are we going? What does this career path look like for this person? Because the problem of often is that we think about, oh, they do admin, that's all. But what are we doing from a let's advance them in their career through training. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later, but how do we train them? How do we upskill them? How do we make them better? But we often don't because we're so afraid that they're going to leave and go somewhere else. And somebody says, oh, we've trained them. Thank you, Francia. And then somebody else comes and poaches them. But I think that has got a lot to do with their job satisfaction, how much they enjoy. It shows how much you value them once we start doing um, those kind of things. But we can't run a financial advisory business. You know, for those of you who are thinking that you can do everything by yourself, I've done that for many years. You get to a point where you're absolutely burning out on the one end, but you get to that point where you just, doesn't matter what you do, you can't make more money. You can't be more profitable because you just don't have the time. The other day I was moderating a panel at a conference and the one person said, you know, when I appointed this person, I grew my business by 300%. But why? Because he took the time that he now saved and he used it in the right manner. He was seeing more clients. He was giving more advice. He was doing the things that needs to be done. Employing someone and keeping your habits and your activities and things the same are not going to change anything. You've got to say, suddenly I've got half my day back. What am I going to do differently? So I'm talking a little bit interchangeably here about the staff and what, what we do because, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't help you having a team, but you're not 
doing things differently now with the extra time that you've got. So that's not very helpful. So we also got to think about that. And also how inspiring is that to, to your team of, of, of staff people? There's also other key positions. The very first one, as I said, I'll always hire for admin because that is a, a time, it just steals my time. But then there are other things. Thinking about pattern planning, I see pattern planning. I mean, we started with pattern planning many years ago. I was involved in, in one of the banks implementing that. Uh, we helped them with that. There was a lot of things around pattern planning, and that was all before its time. And also often people think like a pattern planner is like a super admin person, and that's not their role. A pattern planner should know more than you and me. They should be technically inclined. They should love doing the analysis. They should love working with that. But you and I know today that the value isn't in, in the analysis necessarily. We used to think it was. It's just a necessary piece of information we need in order to have better discussions with the client and to give better advice and to do the right thing. But the value is really in that, in that engagement with the client. It's where we talk to the client, et cetera. So now I'm seeing with that movement towards that where our focus is more on the human side of money, as we put it, and the psychology of financial planning and all these fancy words that we're giving these things that we should be doing in the first place. Now, suddenly, oh, so I, I know I still need to do that, but I actually love doing that. And this is what the client wants. I'm not going to spend my time doing the analysis. I just want to be having these conversations. So suddenly it's this rise now of the better planner role finally in the way that it should be. So I'm very happy to see that happening. But a better planner is probably the second person that I'll hire. The rest of the stuff, the IT, I don't know, anything else could probably be outsourced. Your revenue management could be outsourced to Comspace. Your um, accounting could be outsourced to your accountant. Your like All of these things can be outsourced. But that's the core thing that you need. And maybe the third one that I would then do after the parrot planner, and often we appoint an admin assistant and then we call them the a practice manager or the operations manager or something like that. That is a separate person, but that's only necessary when you have a bigger team, right? So when it's a small team, <clears throat> then the admin assistant can do all of that. Make sure the printer has toner if you're still printing, that the internet is working, doing all these small little things or at least engaging with those service providers. But those are the kind of things that we that we are looking for. So very important then when you start thinking about those things are where are where is the next opportunity in your business to unlock growth? So if you can first stop spending time on admin, start looking for admin people. Okay, and I'm going to talk about effective recruit, recruitment strategies next. But first, get rid of the admin. Don't stop doing admin, or at least minimize the admin that you're doing. Secondly then get somebody to do all the analysis and take the notes in the meetings and do those kind of things. And you just focus on connecting and talking to the client. And thirdly, then if it needs to, you can get somebody to manage all of that for you. And uh, you can just uh, have even more time just to focus on clients and learn and do all the cool stuff um, that really brings in the money. Because your question needs to be, what are the income generating activities that I need to be doing every single day in order to grow my business and in order to serve my clients? What are those things? And that's all that you should be doing. Yet we're doing all this other stuff that are not, not income producing. And by the way, as a side note, issuing an invoice is not income generating. It's the work you do that then gets to the invoice or that results in the commission. So without that work, that's what you should be doing. That's the income producing uh, activity. All right, so then what are some effective recruitment strategies? Because obviously that's why you're here probably this morning is uh, to say, but I'm, I can't find these people and I don't know what to do. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really under pressure. I can't get to everything. I need somebody today. So one of the best things to do is to, number one, be very clear about the role. So when you put the job specs out, it's an it's a excruciating exercise. So you can either get somebody to help you with that or you can obviously uh, do other stuff. Um, you know, just sit down and really think about what do you want this person to do? And does it make sense that this falls within their job role? Because we love putting things out like, oh, I need to do all these things and uh, anything else that is related that I will give to you to do. Like, and that is not nice. But um, that's often what we do. So if, we, if we're not very clear, then the wrong people are going to be applying. Now, one problem that you may have uh, experienced before that I definitely have, you put out a job um, position, you advertise, and people just send their CVs. It's like, geez, did you even read the job spec? They just send. 
Uh, I saw it uh, when I worked for people. I saw it in my own business. <clears throat> it's crazy. People don't read, and that's the other big problem. But then it's an easy way. You don't even spend time to go through their CV. You just start with those things. So do you have the the, the um, qualifications I'm looking for? Do you have the experience that I'm looking for? No, then it doesn't even matter what else happens. So be very, very clear on what you're looking for and also understand if you are recruiting, uh, you want somebody who's awesome and who is teachable and you, who you can develop or whether you're looking for somebody already has everything that you're looking for and can basically mm -hmm. just come and learn your ways of working. But other than that, they understand the job, they understand the language, they do all of those things. So be very, very clear on those because then when you go through the process, it's easy to just throw CVs out. So even if you're getting 100 CVs, you can just chuck them out because it makes it easy. Also, when you have very, very clear job specifications, you are setting the right expectation with that person because that's often where things go wrong is that, oh, I thought it was this and now it is that. That's usually the thing. And then that easily results in becoming a big mess and a big issue. So managing that expectations, the one way to do it is to have very, very clear job specs for that. So that's the first one, right? But then also you can't just look for like hard skills. You can't just be going for, can you use a computer? Can, do you know, da, da, da. Um, you know, and it's fine if people say, yes, I've got this. Yes, I've got this. That's all fine. You also got to be looking at the soft skill side of things. So how are they in communication? Can they follow instructions? This is also something that Michelle sort of shared in, in that session is to say, you know what? Very, very interesting. Like we asked them, like, this is what we want. We want nothing more than two pages. This is what we want. And if you don't send it in that format, we don't even look at your CV because you can't follow instructions. You, And for me, it's actually more than that. The person isn't showing that they are genuinely interested, right? Obviously, one of the big things that we can do going through all of this, there's sort of two options you've got. Either you go look for someone yourself, you advertise on LinkedIn, on Pnet, on uh, send it to friends and family and to your network and all of that, that you're looking for somebody. Uh, checking in with uh, people like us and other advisors, et cetera, and asking if they know about someone. But probably if an advisor knew about someone, they would take them. But, uh, you know, we sort of do that. But the other side is also to get a recruitment agency um, in, involved because then there's some, at least some recourse as well, and you've got additional protection, and they go through the hard work of sifting through the CVs. You just give them a very clear instruction of what to do. The thing is that that usually costs you uh, some money, obviously, and we don't want to invest in it. And for me, it's a lot more expensive getting the wrong person than it is getting the right person, uh, obviously. So whatever money you pay to somebody who helps you with a recruitment, but also I'll look for a recruiter that recruits for financial services and specifically in the admin space or specifically for payroll planners, somebody who really understands that and somebody who's going to take the time to learn your business and your ways of doing things so that they know exactly what they are looking for. So you can outsource that entire recruitment function uh, if you wanted to. But otherwise, you know, there's sort of these, these, these different things that, uh, that, that, that uh, I've been thinking about recently. So one of the things, Daniel Priestley, who was on the, at the summit, one of the things that he often says is like he hires uh, misfits and rebels. <laughs> you know, people that you don't think, uh, people that you know, a family member or a friend of a friend or something like that. That's, and that's great when you're running a startup and that. But... In our world, it's a very professional world. It's all about how we behave, how we connect, how we communicate. So start off with somebody that you think might be, like you can see there's hunger. You can see, not like physical hunger, but they've got a hunger to learn, a hunger to grow. They want to do things. Um, maybe give people like that a chance as well. It's the people often we don't think will be great just by looking and we judge them for what we see. That might very well uh, surprise us. But then on the other hand, you want to be careful not to bring in the wrong person, but start off with family and friends. You know, they say business and family doesn't mix. It's absolutely true. But in some instances, it works very well because family members would not want to disappoint you. But then it's got everything to do with how do we work with them? How do we treat them? Do we treat them differently from our other team members because they're family and we've got to show that we're harder on them? You know, um, are they fitting into the culture? Like all of those things that we really look at when we're building a great team you got to be thinking about that. So that's very important. But here's the thing, right? So I said, hire slow, fire fast. The problem comes in with the whole uh, interviewing process. We have these things where we have 100 CVs, if not 200. We say, okay, here's three. Let me interview them. Let me choose the best one of the three. 
instead of going like, none of these three are really a good fit. Let me start again. So that's where we make the biggest mistake. You, you take the best of the lot you got, and that's not great, right? So if you have a bag full of, of apples that have, uh, you know, half of them are bruised and they sort of turning brown and all that good stuff, but there's one that's, it's also brown and bruised, but it's less than the others. Are you still going to enjoy it like a fresh, nice apple? No, you're not. So you want the right person. So take your time, even if it takes a year. But that's the thing. The second part to this is, apart from being patient, the second big part about if you want to hire the right person is to put them through their paces. So you got to give them a case study to do, like create a document like this for me in Word. Build me an Excel spreadsheet that can do this. And I'm not talking about waste stuff out there that you need somebody with, with coding skills. Just think about that. Then the next one, how do you think about how do you think about um, the other things that we uh, that they need to do? You know, get somebody to call them. Let them let them call somebody and have a conversation uh, with them about something. You know, and see how that goes. So test them. It's not only about that. There's also all sorts of psychometric testing and all sorts of interesting things you can do. Those things are great, but it's only an indication. I want to see how they act in the real scenario and in the moment before you even uh, appoint them. So we can't afford to get people into our business who says they can do the job and then they get there uh, and then they're not. And then the last step on that note, something that I learned from experience is often the person who markets themselves the best and have the most energy in the meeting and is just, oh, the most amazing person, I'm so glad. They're the worst sometimes. I'm not saying always, be careful. But in my experience, the person who was shy and a little bit more introverted and sort of more reserved, those are the people who can do the job. The ones who are like just talking and they're all going about their thing and they just, whoa, this, I love this, love the energy, love everything. They are the ones who get to work that first day in sleep of the and you've got to beg them to get stuff done and follow up 10 times with them, et cetera, et cetera. So be very careful of that. The last thing I want to talk about is sort of, you know, what indication does it give to me when somebody is jumping around? Uh, if you look at their CV and there's gaps or they every two years they've got another job, that's a conversation that I would have with them. I won't just have the opinion that this, because I did that for many, many years, because I'm looking for what I'm actually supposed to be doing. And if I understand that and I can see, but how can I help this person to get to where they want to be and they have all the other qualities that I'm looking for, then maybe it's worth it. I just think, oh, this person doesn't have loyalty. That person is on a journey. So ask the questions around that. And also, if you have somebody who's much older, who's jumping around a lot, then you need to have a more serious conversation. A young person who's jumping around, they're still figuring out what it is that they want to do. So just also see that in context when we are looking for uh, great people. All right. So just some ideas around uh, how you can recruit maybe better, make a better decision up front uh, to, to, to get the best result. Then we recruited this person. They're coming into the business, and this is where a lot of things fall flat. We've got very little things that are documented. We don't have a training program for them. We uh, sort of, they've got to wait for us. We've got to spend loads of time with them in order to train them, et cetera, et cetera. And, Onboarding and training. Onboarding is probably the biggest thing. So whether you're a one-person business employing your first admin assistant, you've got to think about what is the onboarding process for this person? How are you going to get all the information? What systems do they need to go on? How are we going to help them settle and sort of give them a journey that they will go through in order for them to fit into the business and to learn how to do things and what to do, et cetera, et cetera. Which people from outside my business can I get involved to teach them certain things? So often we'll use broker consultants or we use, um, you know, if there's system stuff with, uh, we'll get somebody who's good on the systems with those product providers to come and train them. We don't necessarily train them ourselves. But you've got to think about this. So what is that? So there's the onboarding when they start. There's the initial training to get them settled. But then very importantly, like, what does the ongoing training look like? How do we involve them in things? Right? How do we make sure that, yeah, they're good at, 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 at Microsoft? How do we get them better? So these are all the kind of things that we don't necessarily think about. We just want things to happen because it's forever a rush from the one day to the next and the next month into the next month. End. So think about a career path. Think about how do you keep growing them? 
keep training them, keep taking them. Yeah, I see so many advisors who doesn't allow their, 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 their staff, their admin people or whoever to attend functions or sessions or to go to an event. No, they are the ones who's going, but their staff stay at home. And that's ridiculous. Like, how do you want this person to understand how you think, where you're going with the business? What are the new things we're doing? If they forever, no, no you, you need to stay. I'm paying you a lot of money. You're there to do the admin. That's such a short-sighted way to sort of look at that. And um, it's it's really something that can add a lot of value when we involve them in sessions where it makes sense, to send them on specific training that they may need um, and keep on developing them, invest back into them. Those are the things that really matter to, to, to people. Not everything can be measured in, in, in rands and cents. I think that's the important part for me is that but people become invaluable and you can't always measure like, oh, I spent 5,000 rand for them to go to a training. Now I'm making 10,000 rand a month more. It's not about that. It is about everything else that goes on around it because everything else that goes uh, on around it, that's what leads to the extra rands and cents. Not necessarily just the training that they did. It's who this person is becoming along uh, this journey of theirs uh, for that. So just to maybe uh, reiterate a couple of things, um, I think it is very important that you need to think about the areas in your business that's really keeping you busy, the things that are keeping you from doing the things you love and from helping people in the way you want to help them. Uh, recruit for admin first, then for power planning, and then for everything else. In the meantime, see what else you can rather outsource to people that it doesn't cost you a salary, but it's like uh, either pay when I use you or it's a small retainer that I need to pay. And it's absolutely worth that so that people are on call uh, when you need them. Hire slow, fire fast, uh, do that. Uh, it's part of the game. Uh, make sure that you really go through a rigorous recruitment process. What does that process look like for you? You've got to go through that before you get to, uh, to appoint that person. And then uh, ongoing training. I think that is the, the other big one that is really, really important. Never, ever stop developing your people. Uh, whether you present a training session, you send them on training sessions uh, or any other thing in between, uh, encourage them to learn as well. Um, there's loads of cool stuff available online. Uh, there's many different things that they can definitely learn from. So that would be sort of my message. And I'm keen, I'll, I'll have a look at the comments just now uh, to see what your views are and your experiences. Alrighty, so brilliant stuff. Let's do a little bit of a uh, a uh, giveaway. So sorry, I'm just bringing up. So we've got 18 people in the draw, which is absolutely uh, fantastic. So we are going to be doing the draw in just a second. So you can uh, still comment hashtag passion and uh, you stand the chance to win uh, this incredible book by Mr. Kubis Lane. So looking forward to giving that away in the next second and uh, celebrate with a lo loud applause to the person who wins. Right. So um, let's do it. So let's see who will be winning today's uh, lucky giveaway. And it is really lucky. So let's see who it will be. Boom. I have no idea who this is. Let me just put on the... Uh, so so uh, ho, 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 you got to get in touch with me because I have no idea who you are. Uh, so you can find me on LinkedIn. Send me a message on LinkedIn. And uh, I will gladly then uh, make contact for us to deliver your book. Alrighty, absolutely fantastic. Big congratulations. And uh, so really looking forward uh, to next week. We'll be back same time, same place. Uh, so don't miss out. Uh, we've got quite a few awesome guests coming up in the next couple of weeks. So really excited for that. We'll announce them. So keep an eye on LinkedIn and your WhatsApp. Uh, if you're not part of the WhatsApp group, you can join the WhatsApp group. Let me know. I'll send you the link. Uh, but other than that, uh, have a fantastic weekend. Stay safe. Be blessed and prosper. Continue to raise the ball. Love you. Bye-bye.